I'm reading from Acts 6, 1 through 7, called the Seven Chosen to Serve. Now during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, who we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a pros proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient in the faith. Father, we pray that you would quiet our hearts in this moment. We pray, Lord, that as we continue in our series on the book of Acts and we continue to study the biblical community on the heels of Pentecost, we pray, Father, that you would continue to shape us as a body of believers. I pray that you continue to speak to us, conform us to your image, not only as individuals, but also as a community. May you grow us in you and may you speak to our hearts and may we not be the same when we leave today as we came in. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we continue in our, our sermon series called The Biblical Community with a, a message entitled A Serving Community. Each week we highlight a different uh, aspect or different characteristic of the biblical community and we're taking a look at the, the early church. We're taking a look at what the early church looked like, what the early church lived like, what what their world was like um, as, as they continue to grow after the day of Pentecost. And as we look at this passage in Acts chapter 6, we see a church that's continuing to grow, and we see that as they're continuing to grow, they actually start to hit their first growing pains, you could say. Just as, as early as, as, or as recent as just two chapters ago, in, in verse, uh, at chapter 4, verse 34, we see these words. In Acts 4, 34, it says, There was not a needy person among them. And now, in Acts 6, we see needs start to arise. We see neglect. We see disputes. We see, even see complaints come. And so... While we see this, and as we often look at the, the early church in Acts as, as the blueprint, and, and in many ways it is, uh, as the inspiration for what the biblical community looks like, we can even acknowledge that even there, even in the early church in Acts, they had problems. So I have news for us. Every church has problems. Did you know that? There is no church that has ever been perfect. In fact, if you're, if you're bouncing around from church looking for the perfect church, you're going to be disappointed because there, there's no such thing. Every church has problems. Every church has struggles. Every church has conflict. Every church has growing pains. And as the church is growing, as the church grows, more people come into the fold, more people come into the life of the church, and when more people come in, more problems come in, right? Right? You've heard the phrase, more money, more problems, more people, more problems. Now that's not to say it's a bad thing, it's a great thing. We're excited when new people come to the church. We're excited when new people come to be a part of what we're doing. And that's, that's what we want. We want that to happen. There's a saying amongst pastors, the greatest, the best thing about ministry is people. And the hardest thing about ministry is people. And it's true. But that's what we're called to be as the church. Inviting others, inviting people who are different, inviting everybody into the kingdom of God 
and doing life together as we follow Jesus together. Now imagine with me, you and your spouse are going to the hospital and you're expecting a baby and the mother actually has twins, unbeknownst to you. Have you ever experienced that? Believe it or not, it actually happens, where you go to the hospital thinking you're having one baby and actually you actually have two babies. It's called the hidden twin pregnancy. And even today it happens, it's very rare, but it can actually happen where one of the twins is actually overshadowed or eclipsed by the other and you go in thinking you have one and all of a sudden you have two. And I'm, I, I can imagine being filled with excitement and being filled with surprise, but also being filled with, oh no, we only have one crib. We only have one set of clothes. We only have one set of everything. And you can imagine that's kind of what's going on here. They, they, they are excited for the growth. They are, it, it, they're, they're excited about what God is doing as he continues to increase in their numbers, but yet with that come more challenges. With that come unexpected growing pains. And so we see here in this passage the church kind of dealing with these growing pains and kind of navigating through conflict, navigating through disputes. There are, as we see this passage, there are people groups in the church. There are different people groups. And, and the Hellenists and the Hebrews and, and certain people groups, not just here but in every church, if we're not careful, there are certain people groups who could be considered the outsiders. Now, before we get into this, I want to talk about a people group in our culture, a people group in our world, a people group in our society that can be seen as outsiders. A people group in our society that can be seen as overlooked. A people group in our society, in our world today, that can be ignored. And it's a people group that I must admit your pastor is a part of. One out of ten are a part of this people group. One out of ten are afflicted with this condition. And this condition is called left-handedness. How many of us are left-handed? So if you're left-handed today, you can identify with the affliction that your pastor is a part of. We share in our affliction. We share in this condition called left-handedness. We were born this way. And we suffer as left-handers, don't we? It's hard living in a right-handed world, is it not? Think about it. When we use an ink pen as left-handers and we write, the whole world sees our shame as our palm, the palm of our hand displays the ink on our hand that we are left-handers. And you right-handers, I don't expect you to understand our suffering, right? You've heard the phrase white privilege. There's a such thing as a right privilege. Even in the Bible, right? The left hand gets no love. The left side gets no love. It's all about the right side. It's all about the right hand in the Bible. Most doors open to the right. If, if you're a left-hander, it doesn't really work very well. You have to use your right hand. I remember there's been times when I've been invited to go play golf, and I didn't have my clubs with me, and they would say, oh, you can just use mine. Oh, you're left-handed, sorry. You can't use mine. And I, I, I'm, I'm left out. Try going to a, a store and, and shopping for baseball gloves. Very few baseball gloves are left-handed. Everything is right-handed. Even most coffee mugs, you right-handers, you get to enjoy the logo. We left-handers, we just have to stare at a blank mug. These are little things that we live with every single day. We are outsiders. We have to settle for a very small selection of items that actually fit. We have to conform to your right-handed world. Even zippers with pants. You, you have to go like this to zip. And don't get me started about scissors. We just have to use the right hand. I mean, I don't, I don't understand why, but the scissors in the left hand do not cut. They just don't work. 
I put them to the right hand, they work just fine. When we sit down at a meal with a group of people, we actually have to calculate when we sit and where we sit because we have to be concerned with the person to our left because, you know, our elbow goes this when we do this when we eat. And so we've got to be concerned about the space and are we going to be bumping into their elbow, right? All these things that we walk with, we struggle with every single day. The other, just the other day with my own family, I sat down to the meal and at every plate, the napkins and utensils were set on the right side. It, it hurt a little bit. <laughs> now I'm having a little fun with this, but in reality there are groups of people, there's a, there's a lot of real examples in life where people groups can be left up on the outside. They can be left behind. They can be overlooked. They can be ignored. And, and as we see this passage of scripture, what's going on here is you have the Hellenists and you have the Hebrews. In this early church setting after Pentecost, you had the Hellenists and the Hebrews. Now the Hebrews, the Hebrews were the ones that grew up in the Jerusalem area. They, they were the ones that grew up in Palestine. And so they were, they spoke Hebrew they spoke Aramaic, they, 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 but they also spoke Greek, but Aramaic was their primary language, and they, they grew up in the Jewish culture. But you had the Hellenists, the Hellenists were converted Jews that actually became converted Christians, and they were people who grew up outside of Palestine. They were people who grew up in Greek-speaking nations, so they spoke Greek, and their, 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 uh, their culture was a Grecian culture. So. So here they come, and they, they migrated in, and as they were coming together and becoming the church, you had different cultures colliding, and you had the Hebrew culture, and the Hebrew culture in many ways felt like they were the insiders, and they, they had the culture, they, they owned kind of the, the area, and the life, and the culture, and the setting, and, and the Hellenists came in, they were... They were kind of the outsiders. They had to kind of learn the lingo. There was inside jokes that they had to, to kind of catch on to. There was practices and customs and, and certain ways of life that they had to get used to. And so you had the Hellenists that were kind of sometimes felt like outsiders. And you had this dispute arise. You had this concern, this complaint that arose and, and you, because you had widows in the church. Now widows in this day... Widows were obviously women who lost their husbands, but in this day and time, if you were a widow, if you didn't have family that were still alive, you didn't have adult children or family members to take care of you, you didn't have much options. Widows struggled to support themselves in this day and age. They didn't have the, the safety nets that our society has. They didn't have the, the cultural systems and programs that many governments have set up today. If you were a widow, you could literally starve to death if you did not have a support system. So widows of this kind would actually rely on the church to take care of them. Did you know that the, the idea of taking care of the poor, taking care of the needy, actually came from God? Did you know that originated from God, that originated from the Hebrew nation, the Israelite people, and the church continued it on? It was just something the church did. They took care of those who could not help themselves. And so we see here that the church has the responsibility to take care of the widows, those in need. And you had Hebrew widows and you had Hellenist widows. And what was happening was, whether it was by accident or whether it was intentional because of prejudice, you had some of the Hellenist widows were being neglected. They were being ignored. They're, they were being overlooked. And they did not receive the daily distribution of food. And so this complaint arose, and it was legitimate. And, and the apostles realized this was a real problem. It wasn't just a ministry problem. It was a relational problem. And so we see this happening in the life of the church. And the apostles identified it as an issue. And so they, they delegated... They appointed seven men, and what, what is wise about what they did here was they, they delegated seven Grecian men. They delegated seven Hellenist Christians. In other words, they identified seven people who, who met the qualifications of leadership in the church, but they were of the Hellenist group. 
to allow them to be a part of meeting the own, their own needs. There's a quote by Florence Alshorn. It says this, An idea is not yours until it comes out of your own fingertips. Now what that means is, you can have an idea about doing something, but if you don't actually have a part in that idea, it's not really your idea. I can't tell you how many times in my 20-some years of being involved in the church when Christians have an idea of something the church should do, but yet they, they don't want to do it themselves. They, they think somebody else should do it, right? Any of us ever seen that happen? You know, the church should do this. We should do this. We should do this. Now, they, they won't do it themselves, but they think someone else should. Here, we see the, the apostles say, you know what? Here's a Hellenist issue. Here's a complaint that the Hellenists have brought to us. We're going to include the Hellenists as part of the solution. And so they find these seven men and appoint them to basically run the food ministry of the church. They delegate them as leaders. Now, it's important to, to recognize, it's important to note something here. They didn't just pick anybody. They didn't just pick any, any Joe Schmo to lead this ministry. There were certain qualifications. The first was that they would be of good standing, meaning they had to have good reputations. People had to be able to believe in who they were. People had to be able to trust them. It doesn't mean they were perfect, but they had to, have, they had to be of good standing. The secondly, they had to be full of the Holy Spirit. And third, they had to have wisdom. Not just knowledge, but wisdom. Knowledge is the knowledge of about something. Wisdom is the ability to solve the problem about this something. And so we see that there was thought put into this. We see that there were qualifications put in there. Not everybody in the church is able to be a leader. There are qualifications to be a leader in the church. If you now we invite everybody to be involved. We invite everybody to serve on a, on a, on a ministry team. We invite everybody to be a part of the life of the church. But not everybody is ready to be a leader. There are certain criteria that you, you have to fall into or, or that you have to uh, live by in order to be a leader. Because with leadership in the church, there comes a different level of trust. Right? Anybody with me? We have to be able to trust our leaders. We have to be able to believe in our leaders. We have to be able to follow our leaders. And so with leadership comes a, a, another level of responsibility in the church. And so the apostles delegated this task, this ministry, to these seven disciples. Now, why, why did they delegate? Why did they say, we're not going to do this, we need to delegate this to someone else? It wasn't that it was beneath them. We need to understand. It wasn't that the apostles were saying, you know, we are above it. We are called to the preaching and teaching and prayer. And therefore, you peons can do the dirty work. It's not at all what was happening here. It's not at all what was going on here. And I've seen some pastors, I've seen some ministers, unfortunately, fall into that trap. Oh, I, I, you know, I'm above that. No, no, no. That's not at all what was going on here. They certainly learn after following Jesus and seeing the, the example that Jesus set before them that this work was not beneath them. There's nothing beneath a minister. There's nothing beneath a pastor. There's nothing beneath a, a leader to do. Every pastor, I believe every pastor, every leader, every uh, person in the church should be willing to roll their sleeves up and do dirty work. Amen? And they did that. And, and it doesn't mean that they didn't jump in and get involved from time to time. But what they were saying is this. God has set us apart. God has called us for a specific role within the life of the church. Our primary calling is to teach and to preach the word and to devote ourselves to prayer. And so in order for us to be more effective at our calling, in order for us to be more effective at our primary calling in the church, in the kingdom of God, we need to delegate this ministry that's very important. 
to those who can take this on and lead this ministry. And so it is, it is a matter of calling. It's a matter of understanding the primary calling and devoting yourselves to that primary calling. It doesn't mean that we don't jump in and get involved in other things. I do that myself. Many other pastors do that. From time to time, on a regular basis, they, they jump in and they just take care of things because it needs to be done. In fact, there's been times when people, members of our church, have gotten on to me for doing it. But it needed to be done. But, but it's about keeping the primary calling primary. It's about enabling yourself to focus on the primary calling that God has on your life. And in this case, for these seven apostles or these seven disciples, for them, their primary calling came to be the food ministry in the church. And I want to ask every, every one of us that's here today, what is your primary calling in the church? What has God called you to do in the church? Because every one of you, every one of us here, has a calling of God on their lives. Would you agree? God is calling you to do something. At Springdale Church of the Nazarene, one of our sister churches in Cincinnati, Ohio, they're planning a biker church. And they're in that formation stage right now of planning a biker church. And I love their, their vision statement. This is their slogan. The biker church's slogan is this. Love God, love people, and do stuff. Now, I just love that. Love God, love people, and do stuff. Get up and do things. What is God calling you to do? Not calling you to talk about. Not even calling you to pray about. What is God calling you to actually do in the church? Because there is something that he's gifted you to do. Now, for me, my calling, my calling in this particular case is to teach and to preach the word and, and devote myself to prayer and to devote myself to equipping the saints for ministry. This, this, is, this is a set-apart calling that God has on my life. But there's a calling that God has for your life. Here's some examples. Let's look at it, Acts 13, 2 out of scripture. It says this, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Here's another one. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul writes this, the very beginning of his letter to the church in Rome. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So, so Paul's calling, Paul's ministry, Paul's purpose in the world was to be an apostle for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not everybody's called to be an apostle. Not everybody's called to preach. Not everybody's called to preach, but some are. What is your primary calling? Because you have one. If you are a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, God has called you to something. He has. Because he's gifted you in something. And, and here's the thing. I, I, over, over the years, I've seen many Christians who have started doing something in the church. They, they've gotten all fired up and they've gotten all excited about starting a ministry or starting and serving a team. And then over time, whether it's a few weeks or whether it's a few months, they fizzle, they fade. Their excitement starts to fade. Their excitement, their passion starts to fade. And all of a sudden, they, they're nowhere to be found. And it breaks my heart when I see that happen. Because here's the thing. Here's what keeps us going. If you're called by God to do something, if you're called by God in ministry, it's not the success of the ministry that keeps you going. It's not the people. It's not even the relationships of the ministry that keeps you going. It's the calling that keeps you going. It is the calling of God that helps the discouraged minister. It's the calling of God that helps the tired and exhausted minister. It's the calling of God that helps the scared minister. And when I say minister, I'm talking about every one of us. Every one of us are called to ministry. So you all are ministers. Did you know that? If you're serving in ministry, you are a minister of the gospel. It's the calling that keeps us focused 
on pleasing God and not pleasing men. You see, if we are serving for the wrong reasons, if we're leading a ministry for the wrong reasons to please men, to get accolades, to see a, uh, our, our ministry grow in success, to, to pat ourselves on the back, then we're going to burn out. We're going to be discouraged and we're going to find ourselves fading away because we're not serving for the right reasons. We're not in the, the calling that God has for us. But it is a calling, believe me, believe me, as a pastor, it's the, the calling is what keeps me going. It's certainly not the money. It's certainly not the accolades. It's cert, while those are all nice, while, while the relationships are nice, the people that I get to be a, a part of, the, 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 the love that I experience with and from you is, is wonderful. But it, that's not what keeps me going. Ultimately, what keeps me going and what keeps me, even in my days of discouragement, even my days of being exhausted, even in my days of, of failure, what keeps me going is the calling that God has on my life. And so, I want to ask you this morning, what is your calling? Philippians 1.6 says this, I am confident of this that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? If God begins a call on your life, if he plants the seeds in your heart and in your life and gifts you to do something, He's going to help you continue to develop that gift. He's going to help you bring it to completion. He's going to grow that gift. He's going to equip you to do what He's called you to do. And too many times, Christians quit when things get hard. Last time I checked, Jesus did not call us to conditional service. Did He? Anybody with me? Did God call us to conditional service? He called us to unconditional service. He called us to unconditionally love Him and to serve Him, no matter how hard things get. No matter how it seems that we've failed. No matter how many times we have to pick ourselves back up. Jesus is calling us to something, to serve Him in some way. Even when it gets hard. We tend to reserve this term, full-time ministry, for pastors or evangelists, those in vocational ministry. But I got news for us today. In case you didn't know, you are in full-time ministry. I hope you're not a part-time Christian. I hope you're not a part-time Christian. I hope that you don't see your Christian life as something that's just a part of your life. Every one of us are in full-time ministry. Every one of us. If you're a lawyer, Guess what? Your ministry is at your workplace at the law firm. If you're a doctor, if you are a plumber, if you're a mechanic, if you're a receptionist, whatever you do, if you manage a retail store, whatever you do in life, that's your tent making job. That's your tent maker. But you are a minister. Your person, your whole life should be called into full time ministry. Now, some of us are called into vocational ministry where, where the church affirms individuals to serve in vocational ministry, so, so they are compensated and, and, and they're allowed to devote more time to the ministry. But every one of us are full-time ministers. Every single one of us, if we call Jesus Lord. Listen to this, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of what? Ministry. For building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of a full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the body, the whole body, joined and knit together every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, 
promotes the body growth, the body's growth, in building itself up in love. What that means, what Paul is saying here is, you are a part of the body. You are not insignificant. Your part, your role, your calling has a vital part in the growth of the body, in the maturity of this church, in the health of this church. Did you know that? And what he's saying is, do not be tossed about like a child. Do not let the world, do not let the distractions and, and the, the lies of the devil throw you off and let you be defeated and quit. What he's saying is stick with it. Know you're called by God and, and pour yourself into that calling because you are a vital part of this church's health and growth. And all of us together then grow in the, in the maturity of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 18. And we'll follow along on the screen here. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. In the foot, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, and here's the last three words I want us to, to read together. Read it with me. As he chose. What that means is this. God has chosen you to do something. He's equipped you to do something. He's gifted you to do something. And he's arranged you in the life of this church to do something and to fulfill your calling in the ministry. This is what God calls you to. And he's not sitting here accepting excuses. Don't, don't tell God what I have is not good enough. Don't tell God I'm not able to do anything. Don't tell God that who created you, by the way, who gifted you, don't tell him that what you have to offer is not good enough. Don't hide behind those excuses. Jump in and serve. If you don't know where you're gifted, if you don't know where your passion is, we can help you with that. Pastor Mark, would you stand? Pastor Mark Robinson has just started on, as a volunteer as a volunteer staff member, Mark Robinson is going to be serving as our next steps pastor. And he's going to be helping people who haven't found their place of service. Thank you, Mark. Uh, he's going to be helping us find ways, find, helping people find their place of service in ministry. To either serve on a team or to help lead a team of ministry. And, and, and this is important. This is vital. How many of you have ever broken a finger? Or a toe. Anybody ever broken a finger or a toe? And you, you think in your mind, okay, well, it's just a finger. I can, I can move on. It's just a toe. I can move on, right? And you go to the doctor and, and they say, well, there's nothing we can do for you. Just, you know, we'll just stabilize it and just move on. And you got to live with it, right? You got to live with your pinky being broken. And you think, oh, it's just a pinky. I can move on. Well, then you try to like tie your shoes, right? Or you try to button your shirt, or you try to fix a meal or eat a meal. And all these things that your body needs to do, and, and the little part of the body that's broken, the little part of the body that's not working, affects the entire body's function, right? Yeah, even when we do the necessaries, right? These things are important. And so the little parts of our body, every, there's not one part of our body that does not matter. And so, as little as you feel, or as insignificant as you feel, it's not the case. It's not reality. The, the smallest things, and we should know this by now, Jesus teaches us that the smallest things are, are big things in the kingdom of God, right? Let me tell you something. There was a team, of, there was a couple men here earlier at 8.15 in this morning that set up all these chairs for you. That's not insignificant. That's important, Right? That's a gift. They're, they're using their gifts. They're using their ability to set up chairs so that every one of you can enjoy the comfort of sitting here. How about we just sit on the hard floor or stand the whole time? Would you like that? No, that makes a difference. It makes a difference when those who are there greeting hand you a bulletin with a smile. That makes a difference. Playing an instrument, cleaning the bathrooms, serving in the sound booth, working on the yard, 
working on the grounds, helping to change light bulbs, fixing things around the church, serving in a prayer team, teaching a Sunday school class, leading a small group, all of these things, I, I could go on and on, working in the media, you name it. There's all kinds of ways you can get involved. There's all kinds of things you can do. Serving on the security team. Yes, we have a security team. We need help with them. Serving on our bus ministry team. We need help with that. I'm just going to start naming plugs if you need, if you need somewhere to, to, to plug in. There's all kinds of ways you can get involved and do something to serve. Use your gifts. There is no such thing as a small part, is there? Many of you remember, let's look at this image. Many of you remember in 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion. Anybody remember that? Most of us were old enough to remember that. I remember I was, I was 10 years old in 1986, and I remember actually watching live on television, remember that taking place, because they, they televised those live, and I remember watching it happen. And I remember that the space shuttle going up, and everything seemed fine. You know, they did all their system checks. They checked the engine, they checked the navigations, they checked all of the, you know, the, the astronauts and all the systems were, were, were combed over, right? All, all the important parts, they felt like they were ready to go. And they get nine miles in the air and the whole thing explodes. Remember that? And tragedy strikes. I remember it was, it, was, it was very difficult. It was a very difficult day for our nation. And they, they investigated and found that it was one of the O-rings in the solid rocket booster that expanded just a little too much. An O-ring. One small part. And it caused a leak in the fuel that caused a chain reaction in the explosion. And the entire space shuttle system exploded in, in air and, and all, all of the astronauts lost their lives. There is nothing insignificant. And, and when, we, when we have parts, smaller parts of the body, even if you feel like a smaller part of the body, if you're broken or not functioning, the body's not fully healthy. The body is not fully mature in the image and stature of Jesus Christ. And if we're not careful, if we're damaged, if, we're, if we, we are of ill repair, if we're overlooked, if we're ignored, it can do damage to the body. It can do damage to the church. It can, it can cause tragedy even. And so as we think about this, this image in our minds, we need to remember that little things are important. And we don't want to ever overlook needs of the people. Now, over the years... It's happened. It has. It, it, because we're human. And, and there's been needs in our, our congregation. There's been needs in our community. Uh, there's been needs that people have had that have been overlooked. And they haven't been intentionally overlooked. They just, they've been overlooked either by a lack of time or a lack of knowledge, knowing about it, or a lack of ability or a lack of resources to meet the needs. But here's the thing. If every one of us would step up to the calling that God has in our lives and do what God calls us to do, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, the chances of people in our congregation who are in need to be overlooked are much smaller. Chances of the needs being met, the, the, the Hellenist widows in our, in our circles will be met because everybody will be a part of what's, what God is doing. And, and I... If I spend three and a half hours mowing the yard at the church, which I do, and I love doing, if I do that, I don't mind doing it, but that's three and a half hours that takes away from my sermon prep time, or prayer time, or time that I could spend visiting people in the hospitals, or visiting people at home. And that's just one example, and I'm not complaining, because I love to do it. In fact, sometimes I do it, I choose to do it, because it's like a sanctuary for me. It's a great time to pray. But then I'll have to hear Dick Wilson get on me for doing it. <laughs> but you get my point. And so we are called, every one of us, to do our part, to be our part, and to fulfill the function that God has designed you to fulfill. Here's the result of what happened in our passage, verse 7. It says this, as the result, let's read verse 7 together one more time. It says this in verse 7. The word of God continued to spread. 
You see? So, so as they delegated and as more people stepped up, as more people got involved, and as, as more people did what they were called to do in the life of the church that took care of the other ministries, the administrative tasks, the other, the, the, in this case with the food ministry, which we have, by the way, that's another area you could jump in and help. Then this is what happened. The word, in verse 7, the word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That's not insignificant. A great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The priests, the Jewish priests that wanted to destroy Christianity now became converted Christians. Why? Because the effectiveness of the church, the vividness of the church, the power of the church's presence became greater and enhanced because people grew up in, in their faith and they were willing to serve and do what they're called to do. And the effectiveness and the potency of the Word of God increased in the community. That can happen here. That has happened to a certain degree, but it can and should happen much, much more than it is. So I want to encourage us today. Search your heart and life and ask yourself, what is your primary calling? It doesn't mean that you're not going to be involved in other things. But what is the one thing, what is the main thing God has called you to do here in the church in order to serve Jesus? I want to invite you to stand this morning. And as we close, we're going to close with communion. And this morning, as we read this passage of Scripture, as the worship team comes to lead us, and just a moment, I'm going to ask our serving team to come in just a moment. But... Before we do that, I want to share these words from Jesus. Because think about what happened that night of the Lord's Supper. They're gathered in the upper room and Jesus serves the bread and the wine and He, he talks about how th this is my body which is broken for you, this is my blood which is poured out for you. And what, what happens there that night is... He also exemplifies his willingness to serve in a, in a very humble way. He washes their feet. He exemplifies to them that he's not above doing anything that a servant wouldn't do. He's not above any task. And none of us are above any tasks that God's calling us to do. But as Jesus is teaching us this, and as he exemplifies this that night... We think about the communion elements, and I, I want us to picture the communion elements for just a moment here. As you think about what God is calling you to do in your calling that, you have, that He has on your life. John 13, verses 34 and 35 says this, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now as Jesus says that, he's saying, love each other as I have loved you. And as Jesus offers his body and his blood to be broken and poured out, think about the elements that we received this morning. The broken bread represents sacrifice. The poured out wine, the poured out blood of, of Christ represents service. It represents many things, but in this context, as it applies to what we're talking about today, think about how Jesus loved you through sacrifice and service. And then think about how He's calling you and me to love each other through sacrifice and service. So as we receive the bread and the juice this morning, let us hold that in our hearts and minds today. Let us remember what He's done for you and me. How He's sacrificed Himself for you and me. How He's poured Himself out for you and for me. And now, how He's calling us to be willing to sacrifice and to be poured out wine for each other and for the world. You with me? All God's people said... Amen. Would the team who is coming to serve 
come at this time to help serve communion. We do not require that you be a member of our church to receive communion. We only ask that you place your faith in Jesus Christ. And as the team comes to serve, there's three sections we'll be serving from. In a moment, you'll be asked to file out from your right.